Welcome to this week's um, uh, Sunshine course on accounting. My name is Nigel, I'm your presenter for the, the session. Um, uh, and I'm just going to share the screen, start the presentation. So um, I'll just touch, last week we talked about um, de deciding what categories we need to do accounting. Um, compiling accounts from source transactions. And then when we go through the accounts with management or with whoever we're going through them with, or if we're doing our own business, looking at it ourselves, we may decide we have to rework the categories to be more useful for the particular business we're working on. So we dealt with all of that last week. And this week, we're really going to be focusing on errors. Errors has a whole topic of, in its own right because accounting is, uh, has very great significance. Um, the impact is very great. So if you make errors, it's quite a big deal. So we'll be talking briefly about what errors are. It should be obvious, but actually there's a bit more to it than, than sometimes meets the eye. Um, then we're gonna spend the majority of the time talking about how we prevent errors or pick them up, because I would say it's almost guaranteed errors will creep into the accounts. Um, and then I finally want to talk about something called an audit trail uh, at the end very briefly, and I'll, I'll wait till we get to that to describe what it is. So the first thing just very briefly to talk about is what are errors and what's the big deal about them? Well, accounting errors can happen in a whole variety of ways, as simple as simply misrecording a transaction there's a transaction that costs 153 pounds or 2,750, and you simply type the number wrong and record it as 750 instead of 2,750. Uh, we can omit transactions, so we just forget to record something. Uh, we can record transactions twice. Um, and sometimes we can record transactions that just have nothing whatsoever to do with the business. We'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, the impact of error is really what I wanted to focus on in this particular section. That because we have a lot of accounting controls, we do pick up a lot of errors. And sometimes you sort of forget why errors are such a big deal. But I hope it goes without saying that if you present accounts to someone, say a bank manager when they're deciding whether to give you a loan, uh, or to a management who are deciding on how to run a business, I know one of the person listening to this, for example, uh, does the books for a cycling uh, hub where they do um, a workshop and a cafe. And if the numbers are wrong, the decisions based on those accounts will be wrong. So, for example, if the question is what profitability we're we making from the cafe, if the numbers are wrong, we'll simply make wrong decisions. And it could be that the decision is to ex should be to expand the cafe. But if the numbers show that we're making losses incorrectly, we might close it down. Conversely, if we show the cafe is uh, making losses, for example, on cakes or food, we may decide to stop that. When actually, if it's simply a misrecording, it could be that we need to increase, not decrease, the um, cakes that we're making. So the impact of errors are quite a big deal. And very, I'm going to run through very quickly two huge accounting errors. Um, um, uh, one uh, at Tesco and one at um, Enron. So just going to switch the chair, switch the, the presentation. Excuse me, sorry, just trying to find the spreadsheet. Okay, so hopefully you're now um, seeing the, the spreadsheets. Um, uh, and these are very brief extracts from the accounts of Tesco. Tesco is the, one of the biggest UK supermarkets, um, very well known. And in 2014, there was a scandal because Tesco's simply uh, misaccounted for their profits by an over-aggressive accounting policy. So these are their accounts. And um, I actually, actually had to delve 50 pages 
into the accounts before I actually got to the accounts themselves. But the original report for the year to the 23rd of February 2013, strange accounting year end, but there you go, showed sales of 64 billion pounds, cost of sales of 60, going down to profits of 120 million pounds. And it turned out that the actual figures when they used more appropriate accounting policies were sales of 63 billion. So they'd overstated sales of 1.4 billion. There were various other expenses they simply had misaccounted for. And this was the majority of the, the um, errors that they made. And their reported profits of 120 million actually reduced to 20 million pounds. So although this is just part, not the whole of the um, error, because the errors related to more than one year, the total overstatement of profits was about 250 million pounds. It reduces their share valuation by 10 billion pounds, just making that accounting error. So in the year 2001, Enron um, was uh, involved in a fraud where they um, intentionally overstated overall assets. The Revenues were $100 billion. The profits before tax were $970 billion, uh, million. And in the civil litigation uh, to try and get the money back, these are the, these are the um, overstated profits that the uh, litigants claimed. And they claimed they'd lost $588 million. Uh, million um, dollars. And the overall uh, no one really knows what the total overall profits were overstated by um, because the company went bust, but $74 billion was lost. And that relates to money that individuals had invested in the company, pension funds, and the accounting errors, in this case it was intentional, um, the accounting errors caused a loss of $74 billion to the poor people uh, who had um, what were caught by it. So the big question is for accountants is how do you stop accounting errors? And if there is any one control that every account throughout the whole world that is completely crucial from the smallest to the largest entity has to do, it's the most basic accounting control, is the bank reconciliation. So I'm going to spend about 15 minutes explaining what a bank, rec rec bank reconciliation is, why it's so important, and how do we do it. So you may remember from the previous week's um, courses, we talked about um, uh, listing out bank statements and then categorizing them, creating accounts. The idea of a bank reconciliation is to reconcile the bank statements with the accounts. And of course, the reason why it's such a big deal is often you'll have transactions going through a bank that you may not even have known about. So, for example, if someone pays some money to you by direct bank transfer, unless you've looked at the bank statement and unless they emailed you or let you know one way or another they paid money to you, you simply wouldn't know about it. So there's no way you could have recorded it because you wouldn't know about it. So that's just an example of one of the several things that goes wrong in accounts and the bank reconciliation is the mechanism by which you compare everything you've recorded with everything in the bank statement. So now I'm going to switch over to the uh, to the spreadsheet. Okay, so uh, can I just check that you can see the spreadsheet? Lovely. Okay, so. In this um, example, we haven't yet talked about debits and credits, although most people will have seen bank statements, or they know what debits and credits are on the statements, even if they don't perhaps understand why we use those terms or what they mean. That will come in future when we talk about double entry bookkeeping, that won't be very far off. But this is just an illustration uh, of a very, very simple bank statement. Again, the idea of these examples that we give in this course is that it's so simple that you can almost do the stuff in your head. And the reason for doing that is to, so you can understand what's happening. But in reality, when you've got even a, a small business, you'll probably have about 
four or five times these numbers of transactions. And in a big um, entity, you can have transactions going 20, 30, 40 pages, um, or even more sometimes. So the principle, even though this looks simple, the idea is to design, to illustrate the principles. And so this is a bank statement. And then the next sheet I've done, I've simply restated the bank statement all in a single column. So in this case, a plus is an income and a minus is an expense. So I've listed down in this block here, the bank statement. And if you'll notice that we started off with a bank balance of 1,217 pounds, 1,217. We finished off with 118 pounds, the 118 pounds in our spreadsheet. So I just wanted to illustrate, this is the bank statement. And what I've done is I've listed here separately what we've recorded in our cash book. Now, in this particular example, you've got exactly the same number of transactions, both in the cash book and the bank statement. It's actually very rare that that happens. It's just coincidence this happened. Um, but there you go. So the question for bank reconciliation is, how do we identify transactions in the cash book, which are not in the bank statement, or transactions in the bank statement, which are not in the cash book? So remember, this is an accounting control, and it's all about identifying, have we got the cash book correct? So either way, if we've got items in the cash book that aren't in the bank statement, the question is, is that a mistake? And similarly, if there's something in the bank statement that's not in the cash book, again, the question is, is there a mistake? And of course, if there are mistakes, the whole point is we need to correct it. So how do we go about reconciling the one figure to the other. So there's lots of different ways of doing it. And when we get into computer accounting, um, there's actually a much easier mechanism for doing this. But the reason I wanted to do this, even for people that have computer accounting, is that sometimes these basics help you get the basic principles, help you understand how to deal with the differences. And I've seen quite a lot of examples of people making mistakes on the um, computerized bank reconciliations, not because of the reconciling of figures, but because they did the wrong thing with the differences. So said so even if you don't need to know this, it's still quite useful to have this process. Um, I'm going to start off slowly and then speed up, but the principle of a bank reconciliation is to go to each item in the cash book or the bank statement, it doesn't matter which way around you start it, and make sure that the, you've got a, a, a similar entry in the bank statement. So the easiest way to do it, you'll see I've got some little columns that I've created just after each, each box. The easiest way to do this is that whenever you see an item matching, you tick both sides. So you can tick it, cross it out, highlight it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna put a little X in each, in each of these boxes. I'm going to make it put it in red because it just makes it a bit easier to read. Uh, so, and I'll just get the right size as well. Um, so, uh, sorry, just again to make it easy. Um, so, in this particular case, the first entry, sun, Sunshine Trade, is we'd recorded in the cash book of £121, money coming in. We actually received it on the 7th of February, not the 2nd of February. And this was because we had a check, we paid it into the bank, and it took this long for the bank to process it and record it in the bank, uh, uh, in the bank, um, trans uh, uh, the bank records. That doesn't matter too much. And what I want to say is it doesn't matter because both of these entries happened within the same accounting period. So we talked before about this importance of accounting periods. A reconciliation is every bit as important to look at the accounting periods as accounts themselves. You always do a reconciliation for an accounting period. And the period we're doing is for the month two, the 28th of February, 2021. That's the accounting period. So as long as the entries are in the same accounting period, we tick them off, even though the dates are different. So the next item is Rewind Limited. It's another receipt. And I'm going to look through here. Ooh, I don't see that in here. That's strange. Okay, I'm not going to panic. I know that there's differences. I'm just going to go to the next item. 
The next item, 200 pounds, Harbour Consultants. Is that recorded here? 200 pounds for Harbour? I didn't see that either. Okay, I'm not gonna panic. Um, light streamers, 10 pounds. Nope, I didn't see that here either. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit panicky. No, I'm an accountant, I know not to panic. I'm gonna be methodical. One thing I just want to draw attention to is I'm going through this in order. I don't mind what order this is in the bank statements, but I'm going through this in order so that I know that if I go down to the next item, I've looked at all the items above. And this is quite a big deal where you have items of the same amount appearing in here. And in some businesses that's very rare, but if you go back to our cafe, every time you get people buying the same number of offers, you'll have the same amount in each block. So going through methodically is a really big deal because it's the only way you can make sure that everything's done properly. So Seoul Station is 17 pounds 23, and I'm gonna start speeding up a little bit. Yep, I see that. Okay, Frank Properties 225, yep, I see that. Captain Insurance 83 pounds, yep, I see that. Um, I've done this before, by the way, that's why I know what's there and what isn't there. 110 pounds, yep. So it might take you a long, lot longer than I'm doing now to pick it out, but you'll see it's actually quite a quick process when you get the hang of it. 151 pounds, yep, I see that. 613 pounds, ooh, I didn't see that one. Oh, yes, I do. I'm just gonna quickly draw attention to 613 pounds. It went through the bank on the 8th of February, but we didn't record it until the 24th of February. Why would that be? Well, the answer is that it went through the bank. We forgot about it. And then only when we looked at the bank statements, we noticed it was there, or we subsequently chased them for money. They said, oh, no, no, we've paid you. And we only found out about it on the 24th. So that's a typical reason why you would expect to see these differences. And another £225 for caps insurance. Um, yep, I see £225 here, and I see £225 here. But wait, I've already ticked it. So this is a really gotcha when you're doing a bank rec. Be very careful not to tick something which has already been ticked. Okay, I'm gonna come back to what that means in a minute. But if you, now we've gone through this reconciliation, uh, if you notice, there's a lot of items that have not been ticked. So the first thing I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna say, are, do any of these items that have not been ticked on the back cash book rate the any of items that have not been ticked in the bank statement. And actually look what I can see, there's checks here for £1,210. And because I banked the checks, I probably should have remembered that these three checks equal £1,210. And sure enough, if I look at the paying in slip, yep, I can, I can tick these off because they all tally with each other. So I've now got, an item in the cash book that I don't have in the bank statement. And I've got three items in the bank statement that I don't have in the cash book. I've got um, this check, which I don't know what it is, I've got some interest, and I've got this item to Minster Garage. There's one other thing I'm just gonna draw attention to very briefly, is the fact the bank balance itself at the beginning of the periods were different. And the reason they were different is because last month we did a bank reconciliation and there was an item which was a, a check that was outstanding, um, which was not recorded. Um, and I'm just going to quickly check the difference. I'm going to take one figure from the other. And the difference is 45, uh, £45 pounds 22. And if you look down here, Minster Garage, there's an item with £45 pounds 22. So that relates to the brought forward difference. So I'm now gonna tick the brought forward differences um, because that was simply an item, if you'd done the previous month's bank reconciliation, this would have been much more obvious. Um, so um, the first thing you do with a bank reconciliation is actually to check whether any of the reconciling items from the previous month follow through to the current month. So, Having got these differences, I'm now going to show you how to do the reconciliation itself. So I've created a new um, uh, spreadsheet, and this is a very typical format for reconciliation. You start off by listing the bank balances. The bank balance is 118 pounds 86. 
And if I go back to this page, you'll see the 118 pounds 86. The balance per the account is 432 pounds 76. And again, if I go back to this, the reconciliation, yep, that figure is the same. As it happens, if you look at the formula, I've actually taken this from the previous spreadsheet to try and eliminate typing errors. And I simply listed each of the items that are different. So I've listed the 554 pounds, that's here. I've lift, listed the 15 pounds 10, that's here. Um, and I've listed this 225 pounds, that's here. But what I've done is I've decided uh, which type of difference it is. So the four types of differences you can have, either something in the bank statement that's not in the cash book or vice versa. And you can have that either as an unrecorded receipt or an unrecorded payment. So that's why you've got these four entries. And I've listed out the items in the, in the respective columns. And if you can see when I put all of them through, these figures add up correctly. So I get the figure of 432 pounds. When I add this all, add, add up, add this all up, is the equal total of all these differences. So because I started off with a bank balance and I've ended up with a cash book balance and I've listed all of the items in between, I know that these are the all these are all of the differences in the bank reconciliation, differences between the cash book and the bank statement. The next question I need to ask is, which of these represents an error in the books? Which of these do I need to adjust the cash book with? And which of them is simply an error, a, 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 something that's through the bank that's not in the bank statement that will appear either last month or next month? So going through each of these individually, the unrecorded receipts with £15.10 of interest, this is something we should record in the accounts. The unrecorded payment of £554, this £554, that's an item in the bank statement that our insurance broker or whoever it was took by direct debit that we didn't know about and we should have recorded it if we'd known about it. So this is something that needs to be adjusted in the accounts. And this £225 is a check we've written to Caps Insurance on the 28th of February and it's not going to clear their account or our bank statement until March. So this is what we call a timing difference. So these two do require the accounts to be adjusted. And this one does not require the account to be adjusted. And because I know that this is a bit complicated for people to remember how to adjust to correct errors, I'm going to suggest for you a slightly less conventional format, but actually one I think will serve you a lot better, that I'm actually going to put this bank reconciliation into two separate columns. Instead of starting with the balance per the bank statement, and ending with a balance for the accounts, I'm going to start off each thing, each column with a balance for the bank statements and the balance for the accounts. What I'm going to do is, if there is an entry in the accounts that needs where the accounts need adjusting, I'm going to put them in this column. And if it's simply an entry in the bank statement that will clear itself in due course, I'm going to put it in the bank column. So in these particular examples, the interest is something for which I did have to adjust the accounts because so I'm going to show an extra 15 pounds being paid into the accounts that will increase the bank balance in the accounts if we record it correctly. Conversely, there's this unrecorded payment which will reduce the bank balance. And once we've recorded it, it will reduce the total. And that means that we, the corrected figure will be 106 pounds 14 once we've recorded it correctly. The bank statement of 118 pounds, there's just one entry, which is not really an error, it's just a timing difference. And in this case, it's this unrecorded item of 225 pounds. When that goes through the bank, that will reduce the bank statement by 225 pounds to bring it down to 106 pounds. And look, the figures tally. So this figure here is no longer just reconciling from the bank statement to the accounts. It also tells us what the correct accounting figures should be. Wonderful. That's a really big deal. So I'm now going to switch back to the uh, presentation. 
So we can get back our, get our bearings back again. So we've talked about a bank reconciliation. What is it? Why is it so important? And we've just now been through how you do it. What about other accounting controls? As I said, the bank reconciliation is the most important of all controls, but other accounting controls, um, I'm gonna run through them very quickly, uh, simply because we're, we don't have enough time to go through them in detail. As we go through the rest of the course, we will touch on these in detail. But the first one is spreadsheet controls. There's a whole series of simple errors that you can put in spreadsheets um, and I'm going to really quickly give you an example of, of one of them um, and, and how to fix it. Um, so this is the what I call spreadsheet vulnerability. In this spreadsheet, we would listed out the bank transactions and then we categorized them. And on the face of it, these are the figures that go through to the accounts. But in accounting, it's very easy to make mistakes. And there's a very simple check, which again, whenever you're doing spreadsheets, you need in every single spreadsheet. And the check is this. If you've done your categorizations correctly, then this figure, the total, must equal the sum of all of these figures. It's actually quite simple when you've got, uh, when each allocation is one item itself. But sometimes you might have an item where, frank properties, where some of its rent rates maybe some of it's recharged utilities for example gas and light and heat so this item that you're analyzing can go into more than one column so what i'm going to do in this column uh, in um, so th the total figure is the total of all of these the total of our payments and similarly in each of the categories i've added up everything that goes in the category so if i've done everything correctly the total of all of these columns must equal that total. I'm actually just going to check if it does. So the, the formula is, um, does this figure here equal, if I'm going, to deduct, I'm going to deduct from this figure the sum of all of these. So again, just to, what I've done is I've taken this figure here, C19, 822 pounds, and I'm deducting from that the sum of all the rest of these figures. And if I've done everything correctly, the figure should be zero. Oh, it doesn't. There's an error of 19 pounds 23, 90 pounds 23. And you look at this, we'll say, how could that be? It's not possible, I've just analyzed everything. And I can just tell you straight away that light streamers, can you see, I've actually forgotten to allocate it anywhere. So if I put light streamers, if I put the 10 pounds here, straight away this figure changes, but it still hasn't got to zero. So a shortcut way of identifying the difference is to add up these rows, these columns, the allocated columns, and deduct the total. And in this case, it's zero. But if I copy this down, you can see where all the errors are. The errors in total at 120 pounds, 100 pounds, 23 B. I don't know if you can do that in your head, but that's these two figures together. And if I look at the 17 pounds, 23, again, I've forgotten to allocate that. So if I now go, now go through and allocate it, I put in the plus figure that's gone to bigger. That's because it's a minus 17 pounds, 23. And I've forgotten to allocate this 83 pounds. And this one goes into, I'm gonna put it into here, yeah, materials. So this has gone down to zero, this has gone down to zero. I call this a checksum, um, just because it's something that I uh, do fairly easily. And whenever you do any spreadsheet accounting, I would just urge you that whenever you do totals and subtotals, always create a checksum to make sure that your analysis has been done correctly. And typically, if you do things on a monthly basis, so if this is month by month rather than by category, and you have a total here rather than here, that's a very typical layout. If you're doing a, a, a um, cash flow forecasts or doing monthly accounts for an annual period, I can just tell you this checksum will save you a huge number of errors. So let me switch back to the spreadsheet, to the presentation. So some of the other tests um, to go through very quickly, um, reasonableness testing. 
Um, if you look at the accounts, just have a look and see if it makes sense to you. If, for example, you've got sales and sales show a negative figure, instead of showing plus sales, again, coming back to the hub, the, the cycling hub, you've got service, service, um, you've servicing bikes and shows you've got negative income, clearly something's wrong. Um, if you've got sales of a thousand pounds and material uh, costs of nil, you would want to know how could that possibly be? Um, on the face of it, something's very obviously wrong. So you would typically look at accounts yourself to just say, does it look and feel right to you? But in particular, when you go through the accounts with the management, one of the functions of the management review is to make sure um, that you've identified um, the entries correctly and the management will know what the figures should look like. So another accounting control, which is a really important one, is to make sure that the person authorizing the payments is different from the person recording the payments. And the reason for that is it's so easy to create fraud. So if you look at the Enron, this is what happened, is that the person authorizing the payments wasn't sufficiently different from the person recording the payments. As it happens, they were in cahoots with each other. Um, but, um, but you want to separate out the bank payment system. And in particular, you want to limit how much authorization different people can pay. Again, just to stop people making erroneous payments, just there's so many reasons that happen, so many errors that you pick up if you limit the bank payments, uh, you, you create an upper limit to the payments that you can make to people. And the final thing just to touch on is, the more division of duties you create in an accounting system, that's the more separation of people doing the work, preparing the documentation and recording it, the more people involved in it, the less likely you are to have error. Because if one person does something and somebody else records it, you've always got this check of the person who originally instructed something picking up if something went wrong. So these accounting controls, the bank reconciliation, spreadsheet controls, reasonableness testing, bank payments authorization, division of duties, these are all very basic ways by which you can pick up accounting errors. And there'll be various other ones that we'll talk about through the rest of the course. But I just want to touch very briefly on something called an audit trail. So an audit trail is about how you identify an entry in an accounts back to the source transaction. And this is a key bit again in terms of finding errors. So in order to explain this again, let me just quickly show you a spreadsheet because it's much easier to see uh, if you see it illustrated. Um, so um, if you can picture back last time, we created a set of accounts based on these figures here. So this is um, income and these were various expenses. If you present just the accounts to management, they may well say to you, I don't understand why rents was so high this month. What an audit trail is the, is the mechanism, the trail by which you can go from the total figure back to each of the individual transactions. So in this case, the 225 pounds, it was just a single transaction, but the 383 pounds was four or five, well, in this case, four items added together. So if management said other eight, 383 pounds, this is more than rent, that just can't possibly be right. You would have to work out, you'd have to be able to identify what made those figures up. And the audit trail is the way by which you can identify the individual components that make up a total. Actually, it's a two-way process because I similarly want to know within these light streamers, where does that end up in the accounts? So an audit trail says, take your total accounting figures and you've got to be able to track back where they came from. In this case, I can do that. Or similarly, if I've got an item here, where does this appear in the accounts? In this case, it goes to materials, that figure ends up in the accounts. So it's a two-way process. And one of the things that's critical with an audit trail is it's not enough to be able to list this. You actually want to be able to go back to the document from which that transaction was recorded. 
So we're going to take a audit trail and insert a column. Um, and I'll put some type of reference number here. And this reference will link to an account, uh, to a filing system about how I can find the documents. So I may simply have a pathetically simple system, give this a reference one, re reference two, reference three, reference four. What I mean by that reference is this invoice or this uh, for the light streamers, I'll simply put the number four on the document, file these in numerical order, and that way I can get back to look at what the individual invoice is if I want to do so. But I might have a more sophisticated system. Say this is um, uh, the year 2021 um, in February, and this is my 53rd transaction. I need to make this slightly wider. Um, 2021, two, and then the and then the 54th item. And that way, again, I can file these in some type of order. Or what I do, because I now file everything electronically, is instead of saying, putting the number 53, I put sunshine, I put the whole date in, um, 02, um, sunshine traders PDF. And using this system, I actually file this electronically. I can very easily trace back to what each of these documents are through my electronic system. So you can create whatever reference you want to for the audit trail, but the important thing to identify is if you've got to figure in your accounts, how do you get back to the individual invoice or the invoices that it comprises? Because when you do so, it may be the management say to you, no, that 225 pounds, although you say it's insurance, actually that's my rental company, that's wrong. And so the management might identify an error simply by having gone through that audit trail and now it's corrected. So an audit trail is the ability to go from the accounts back to the individual transactions and vice versa. And if you download from the, um, um, the website where you've got this course, um, I've given a list of different types of errors where you can lose the audit trail. It looks so easy when you're doing it this way around. This is because this is a properly constructed accounting system. But do you remember there were three checks that were all banked together? If instead of entering these as three en entries, I'd simply recorded this as one, one, um, one banking, and I just said um, bankings, I've lost my trail from that 12, 1,210 pounds to the individual people. Well, if my reference document goes back to a paying in slip, and that gives me the details of those three people, then I've got the audit trail. But if for some reason I lose the paying in slip, or worse, I don't record on the paying in slip who those checks were for, I've lost my audit trail. So just putting that back in, so I would have lost the ability to trace where these three items, uh, where they come from. So an audit trail is about creating an accounting system where you always are able to trace both forwards and backwards. Forwards means going from the accounting, an individual transaction to where it is recorded and backwards from the accounts to which each item goes to make it up and where that item itself comes from. And if you've got, I'm just gonna copy these down and just do, um, just because this makes it easy, let's have this really very simplistic system. If I wanted to look up what makes up the materials, I know that invoice number 12 in my filing system is Axial 613 pounds, Caps Insurance 83 pounds, RB Wind, wind Made is um, 865 pounds. I can go back to the original invoice and just confirm that that was the, I've got the right person, I've recorded it correctly, and that this is in fact categorized correctly. Thank you for listening to this course. Um, what we dealt with during today's session was errors. Of course, this is an introduction and a lot of accounting is about preventing errors in the first place and picking them up. At the heart of almost all accounting errors is, uh, and accounting controls is the bank reconciliation. Once you've got your bank reconciliation done, there's a whole series of ways by which you can increase and improve on the accounting controls. 
Um, and it depends on the business as to what type of controls you want. Uh, and involving management in the accounting process, even if it's just going through the accounts with them and just checking with them that it all looks reasonable, is an incredibly important control to make sure that the accounts are both correct and complete. So in the exercises, um, there's an ex uh, example of how you do a bank reconciliation, both uh, in the simplified format, but also in the format that I propose you, you do. There's also a couple of exercises, and if you'll do those, I think you'll find it will bed down this process of bank reconciliation if you haven't done it before. It will also help you identify the difference of transactions and give you some insight into how to correct the accounts once you've picked up the differences. So thank you for listening. And until next week, thank you very much. <laughs>